Okay, uh, well, welcome back, y'all. Um, and I appreciate anybody listening. The last two, the last two that I posted on Buzzsprout, I got uh, only one download on each. And I don't know if that has anything to do with not picking that magic uh, mic, uh, which I might, I might do it. I might do it for this one to see if there's any difference. But I'm also throwing some ads at it, and uh, I get it. It's probably not that interesting. I probably need to find somebody to join me on the podcast, which uh, might happen soon. So, in the last week, I've uh, submitted. The poems, the third quarter of uh, the quarterly current events and irreverent poems. But it got kicked back to us because uh, our buddy Nick uh, picked a pretty cool section for the, uh, what's it called? Like the teaser, but it wasn't long enough. So they asked us to do it again. And then uh, that's using my pen name. And then my real name, I published that book, too, a couple weeks ago. And then I, I picked the narrator for the audio book. But I found a couple mistakes, so I'm going to go back to the drawing board and work on that. All right, so I'm waiting for a pizza. The guy just texted me and said it's going to be another 20 minutes. It's 6.30 on, Saturday, on Friday night on the 3rd. And, um, yeah, we might get Nick on it on a podcast once the poems uh, audio book goes live, but yeah, it looks like this is going to be the eighth one. This is going to be the eighth audio book. I've got seven. I mean, audio book, eighth podcast, number six and seven have not gotten much traction at all, but number five got uh, 13 downloads. So I don't understand the mess of the formula, but I am uh, trying some ads again. At least in the short run. So, uh, let's see. Maybe this one. Which ones have we picked so far? We did chapter 2, chapter 8, did chapter 12, chapter 3, chapter 5, chapter 16. Let's do chapter 15. I think that's the one when I got rolled by the hookers and they stole my car. And uh, I had to break into my house and some other shit. So I'm going to play the first couple of minutes of that one. Hope you all like it. And then I'll be back. Peace. Chapter 15. Hennessy Blacked Out. When I die, bury me inside the booty club. Two chains. I haven't told this story to many people. And if you've read this far, you've earned it. This one doesn't involve dating apps. But each time I think about that long scratch on my back, it makes me shudder. The memory of falling in the bushes outside Caesar's palace en route to the Imperial Palace causing the scratch kills me. How I was lifted up by two hookers defies logic. I'm a selfish prick and put my friends through some insane bullshit. Writing this memory, like many of the others, has helped it haunt me a little less. The whole morning, I kept saying they, and Pete was like, who the fuck are they? I knew they existed as evidenced by all my shit being stolen but I couldn't tell him much more. I had no memory of the night after dancing with two beautiful young ladies who were way out of my league. I don't know if this is real or my dreams, but maybe a blonde or an Asian worked me over. I woke up in my hotel bed, staring at the nightstand phone without my glasses and knew I was fucked. We opened the second bar about 100 days after opening the first one. And I didn't take a day off until the day after they stole my shit. The second store was in a Harris, now Caesar's property, called Bally's, on the corner of Flamingo and the Strip, and the first was in Mandalay Bay, or MGM. I still had some room comps, and was looking to party since we were doing well selling frozen drinks to people on vacation in March 2010. I was drinking heavily at this point, and wouldn't quit for another year and a half. I do a shitty job of learning from mistakes. I tried to take precautions, like drunks often fail rationalizing getting a room across the street from a party so I could get wasted and not drive home. When drunks want to party and cut loose, not much gets in our way, except a couple of determined moms. I didn't consider how far the walk across the strip would actually be. We had store number three at the Luxor under construction, and were finishing up the details on number four at the Rio, another Harris property, when the liquor company started noticing our ability to move cases. 
They wanted a chance to sway those purchasing decisions, and I was lucky enough to be invited to a launch party at Pure Nightclub in Caesars. The party was hosted by Southern Wine and Spirits for Hennessy Black, and I used my comps at the hotel across the street. The IP, which is now the link, also had a high-volume daiquiri bar catering to the frozen drink crowd like us. We knew the lease was running out, and word on the street was the owner was once a high-stakes gambler that lost his money and stopped playing. Since he quit gambling, we figured there might be an opportunity to offer more rent on the renewal. I used the whole experience to convince myself I was doing research like the dumbass drunk I was acting like. I took a casino management course at UNLV and learned that the New York, New York was one of the first strip casinos to lease out most of the F&B outlets in the hotel as the business model started in the late 90s. Beginning a few years before I moved there, third-party retail outlets became the trend. Often the space was gifted or partnered with the friends of executives and high-rolling whales, which kept the casino bosses in control of the performing assets. Later, the celebrity-chef partnerships dominated before returning to the casino-run operations. I don't remember checking in. I don't remember eating dinner. I don't remember much other than pouring a drink and walking on the dance floor then dark. I do remember seeing a few of the sales representatives and sipping out of a tall highball glass, but not being able to see what I was drinking. I knew it was called Hennessy Black for a reason, so I wasn't alarmed that I couldn't see it and wasn't worried about being roofied. Then I was dancing with two of the sexiest women I've ever seen in my life, and I kept wondering to myself, what do they want with me? Me waking up naked with no glasses, no wallet, no keys, no luggage, no toothbrush, no briefcase, no passport, no dignity, and no clue was the next thing I remember. I freaked out and grabbed the phone and called Pete surprising the daylights out of him that random Wednesday morning. I don't remember what I told him, other than I needed help because I'd been robbed and I don't remember getting back to my room the night before. Seemed like he got there pretty fast, and since I didn't have my glasses, I was blind, relying on his help guiding me out of the hotel. For some reason, I only had the clicker for the car but no keys, so he drove around the garage for a few minutes listening for my car. Several times, he noticed I was saying they and we, and kept pressing me to remember who I was talking about. I either blacked out from the booze, or they roofied me, or both. I'll never know without hypnosis, but I'd rather not waste it on this experience. Okay, uh, yeah, if any of the listeners have any experience going on the hypnosis, or like past life regressions, or current life regressions, remembering things where you blacked out from drugs or alcohol, send me a message on the, in the notes or leave, you know, on my website, once too many, uh, Vegas.com. <clears throat> I'll, I watch the TikTok videos and I think about it. I don't think about it a lot, but I do think about uh, trying to piece back together that night. Actually, the thing I would love to do the, the, the hypnosis for is the past life regressions. I'd love to figure out how many I had and then the stories behind each of them. And then I'd love to write a story about them all having dinner together or going to a Pelicans game or some shit. But the thing that I I heard about the other day that I think is a little interesting is called imprinting. And if that is actually what happens to us, which makes sense why a lot of people think that they were Cleopatra or somebody famous or some shit like that. It's like a, it's like they are, you know, copy and paste, you know, like the, like <clears throat> templates and shit that we, you know, you don't, you wouldn't necessarily need to live. There wouldn't be your past life. It would just be the pr- imprint of of a, of a past life or a set of experiences that's common. That's kind of fucking crazy to think about. But, um, all right, I'm going to go back and uh, play a little bit more of this one. And, uh, yeah, it's definitely painful. This was not a uh, – I did not meet these girls on the dating app or the, the, sh- the seeking arrangements. And this was st- when I was still drinking. So um, I'm thinking it was like March – of 2010 ish March of 2010. All right, cool. I hope y'all enjoy. I'll go back to it. Peace. We left the Imperial palace 
and went straight to my house, where his locksmith buddies met us. They broke into my front door and replaced all the other locks, since the girl stole my car with the keys and garage door clicker. I unplugged the door motor and used the manual lock as if it were necessary. We wondered if they had already been to my house, but it didn't feel or look like they did. All I wanted to do was order a pizza and take a nap, but I needed to call Allstate for a rental car, file a police report, and cancel my credit cards. Before noon that day, I got a call from the security desk of the IP saying they found my passport, credit cards, and driver's license in the hallway on the 12th floor, the same one I was staying on. That was a huge relief, because I didn't need to replace all that crap, further complicating an already stressful event to recover from. My head was still pounding, and I wanted to sleep. I didn't want to file a claim with the hotel, since we had businesses in the other properties, and didn't want to jeopardize the relationships. Obviously, we wanted to do business with this one, so I was very vague and delicate on filing the security report to get my stuff back. One of the loneliest feelings I could share with you is waiting for the security to retrieve my stuff and the self-doubt that grinds away. Life was happening all around me during the moments that felt like eons. Then he asked me to sign off on releasing the items. Filing the auto insurance claim to get the rental started the 30 days before they considered it a total loss, I also needed to call my homeowner's insurance to claim what was stolen from my hotel room and inside the car. It felt like I got robbed again when Allstate didn't pay me for the replacement cost of my luggage, which I saved 350 bucks in high school to buy. They used the current price the claims agent found on Google, which didn't exist when I bought that Eddie Bauer luggage set. I also had a nice watch in the console that I took off so I didn't get robbed, and they took the whole car. After using the rental for a couple weeks, it became apparent I may never see that car again, so I went to my buddy Mike S., the same guy I'd met for the Panid Veal and Alfredo. He worked at a Chevy dealership way up in North Vegas, not far from Bob Taylor's ranch house. I test drove a handful of cars before deciding on a fast little black Infiniti two-door. Since I didn't have the cash for the down payment until I got paid from the insurance loss, and the front seat was shaky and needed to be repaired, he said it'd be another week. Everything about the car was great except the driver's seat, which would rock back and forth when I'd brake so he ordered some parts. I signed all the papers and was ready to give up on ever seeing my mom's old Camry ever again. I still hadn't given up drinking and was having beers at the Buffalo Wild Wings down the street from my first house when I got a call from an odd number on caller ID. I had a feeling it was the police, so I ran outside to answer. I was right, and they found my car, and I had 45 minutes to pick it up or they'd need to have it towed. It was parked in a residential neighborhood off Smoke Ranch in Buffalo, near my old insurance office. The policewoman said the homeowner had seen the car in front of his house for a couple of weeks before finally calling to report it. This made me question the urgency of picking it up in 45 minutes, but I kept it to myself. Oh, man, oh, man, I just listened to that. Uh, I tell you, I really miss that old, uh, and I say old because it's been there since I had first moved out to the southwest part of Vegas, that Buffalo Wild Wings. I miss being in that Buffalo Wild Wings. I miss it when it was uh, not a whole lot of people living over there. Now it's packed. Now it's right by the casino and down the street from the water park. And that was a cool little neighborhood, but I, like, yeah, I miss uh, going to play some video poker and having a couple of beers and a Buffalo Ranch chicken wrap and going home to pass out. But uh, case of right, it's a those, yeah, how's it, uh, Tom Petty song go? Uh, made his, uh, oh man, I forget. Sued, yeah. <laughs> I can't remember. It is memories be tough to find or some shit. It's not that. That's not right. Um, there's a good. There's a good quote in there. If I can remember it, I'll come back and and tell it. But uh, uh, anyways, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of it. I'm not. Uh, this feels a little little non climatic, but I'm waiting on a pizza and. Uh, I got a couple of bets going on a hockey games tonight. So I got uh, a New Jersey seems kind of hot, the Devils. So I, I took them and I put them on a parlay with a couple other things. And I kind of like the plus 18 and a half on records tomorrow against Ohio State. But anyways, yeah, 
May those good old days, uh, those good old days, no, not, shall not be passed, or may those good old days will not return, or something like that from Tom Petty. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess anyways. All right, take it easy. Enjoy the rest of it. Peace. I started to panic a bit because I didn't know if I'd have enough time to make it. I had at least two beers and wasn't confident about drunk driving and speeding in a rental car. Then I didn't know what to do with the rental car once I got my car back. I surely couldn't leave it in front of the same guy's house, or he'd have it towed in the morning. The clock was ticking, which imposed the largest monetary penalty. I'd have to pay to get it out of the lot and wait to be reimbursed by the insurance. I called my good buddy and the manager of the bars at the time, Stephen, and asked him to meet me back at my house in about an hour. That gave me enough time to drive there in the rental, leave it down the street, and drive my car back home. Then he could pick me up and bring me back to get the rental, and I could go back home while he went back to work. When I got to my car off Smoke Ranch, I used my valet key to unlock the doors and start the engine, immediately realizing it was totally out of gas. I tried to coast out of the neighborhood so I didn't burn any remaining fumes trying to get to the nearest gas station. I was relieved the car was in one piece, but nervous about breaking down while trying to let my buzz fade away. I made it down the road and around the corner. I could see the gas station, a well-lit, mostly empty, terrible herbst. I came to a full stop at the stop sign when two cop cars rolled up behind me blaring their horns and sirens, yelling at me over the megaphone to put my hands up where they could see them. I started crapping my pants. Two cops came running up on each side of the car with their guns drawn while I was yelling that I picked up my car after getting a call from someone at the police station telling me where to pick it up. I must have been convincing enough from repeating the same message that one went back to the car to verify. A few moments later, the light shut off, the other cop disappeared, and the voice over the loudspeaker told me to drive safe. I made it to the gas station and was able to fill up before heading home to meet Stephen. One of the oddest lessons from the experience was seeing the bills for my credit cards over the next few weeks. They tried using them all, and most were maxed out, but some showed the items purchased, like the Redbox movies titles they rented. Obviously, they tried getting cash and probably hustled my PIN number, but I didn't have much to steal. What little credit I did have was used to rent children's movies and cartoons. I was dancing with moms when I blacked out. I should have learned my lesson and quit drinking, but I went another year and a half before jumping 72 feet off the end of Las Vegas Boulevard and finally stopping.